is good to see you tonight. Let me get there. Let me, there we go. Hey, we got it on the first try. What do you think about that? All right. Hi. <laughs> good to be here tonight. It's been one of those days. What can I tell you? All right, Miss Terry, good evening to you. It's good to see you. And there is my dear Terry. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Ryan, <coughs> good to see you and sit you there. He has a prayer request. They're going to be moving into their new house out in, is it Scapoose that you're going? I think, or that's right, Scapoose. So in a couple of weeks. So they're getting packed up and ready to make their move to Scapoose. All right. Jensen's are here. Yay! God bless you. It's good to see you, Buck and Janice. And Pastor Luciano, my dear friend, a good morning to you. Uh, how is everything going in the Philippines? How's the weather? How are you doing? How's your family? Two beautiful, wonderful daughters. Uh, and they really are. They're twins, and I can... I, I can I can appreciate that because I have quit twins too, as you all know. So we love you. Uh, let us know how things are going. All right, Carrie, it is good to see you tonight too. That is great. Twice today. That's a blessing for me to get to see you twice today. All right, as we get rolling, I think I'm hoping that we can uh, kind of wrap up this look that we have at the uh, the new covenant we've been looking at the biblical covenants and right now all we've looked at all of these old testament covenants and now we're coming down and seeing how the new covenant fulfills all of those other covenant promises uh, praying for you and your family in your ministry uh, yes okay yes absolutely you got to Pastor Luciana has a really, really precious family. And, uh, you know, uh, just, just, it, it, it's good. Pray for them. And, and this morning, we had our brother from Honduras on. So uh, we got connected there. Still trying to make some more formalized connections. Uh, we've been kind of phew, missing each other. But we'll make that connect. We'll make that connect. And uh, pray, keep, so keep him in prayer. Also for Pastor Sadich, I've been sharing the last two mornings. He had sent me a video. I don't know whether I still have it out here or not, but he had sent me a video. Well, I know I have it out there, but I don't know which one of the many ones that I have out here is the one that uh, you know that I shared the other day. But they have uh, they have this. Uh, uh, festival for the elephant god going on in their area and uh, I've, I've witnessed uh, some of those uh, festivals uh, to the various and different gods and uh, they can get uh, pretty scary uh, there's a great deal of consumption of uh, uh, mind altering substances and things can get pretty wild people get worked up into a fever and uh, you know some really bad things. So they're out there trying to witness and trying to minister in the midst of this atmosphere. And uh, it's not the safest place in the world. But uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think let me close this up. Let me, uh, let me for those of you that. <laughs> So you know what to be bearing for, though. 
So pray for their safety and their protection and that God might move in and begin to stir hearts toward himself. Uh, it's a really, really dark atmosphere uh, that surrounds those in those areas but really really surrounds those kind of festivals so be much in prayer if you would I would appreciate it and I know Pastor Sadich would as well so uh, you know as, as we continue to move forward looking at the new covenant and the new covenant promises that uh, we have been given we understand that it fulfills all of these Old Testament covenants that uh, and promises that God has made. And the new covenant fulfills, for example, the promises to David. And we're going to be looking at some of that uh, later. But, uh, you know, according to uh, Isaiah, for example, the new covenant is called the everlasting covenant and would be based on this future uh, uh, Dave, uh, Davidic covenant faithfulness in Isaiah 53, or 55, verse 3. It says, Incline your ear and come to me listen that you may live and i will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to david now last week we had shared with you that it was there uh in the upper room at the last supper that jesus ate with his disciples that jesus uh, interpreted his impending death at that that would ratify if you will the new covenant on the night uh, of, of uh, you know, before his death, he took the bread and he explained that it represents the suffering and sacrifice that he would go through. Uh, does it not? His broken body. And then he takes the cup and as he pours it out, he declares that his death would be literally that which brings in the new covenant. Now these first five covenants that we looked at provide a skeletal framework and gives us the context for practically every page within the Bible. Uh, they are fundamental, I, I believe, to understanding you know, God's redemptive plan rightly. The Old Testament covenants establish promises that look forward to fulfillment. Uh, I agree for those who place little stock in uh, the study of the Old Testament believing that it no longer has any relevance to us, except for those uh, direct references in Scripture to you know, various Old Testament Scriptures. The problem uh, with that is Paul makes it very clear that all everything that happened to Israel happened for our benefit, for our instruction, for our education. So much of the New Testament is concerned to show how Jesus uh, fulfills these covenant promises and what life should look like for the people living in and under the new covenant because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And on the basis of his finished work, there upon the cross then, the new covenant uh, is given to us and we come into it, though it's not fully consummated yet, is it not? Uh, we're still waiting for some of those covenant promises to, uh, to come to fruition, and they will when Jesus comes back and we enter into the millennium and then later into eternity, all right? Uh, as is our custom and our practice on Wednesday night, we spend some time uh, looking at uh, mission videos. I have run across one that, that came out uh, several years ago because uh, David Platt is in it. And, uh, and and some others, but uh, uh, I, I was intrigued by the, the, the title of it, and it is, I Am Southern Baptist Missions. In other words, you are, when somebody asks what are, you know, what, 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 what are Southern Baptist missions, missionaries, you can say, I am Southern Baptist Missions. And I, I was kind of intrigued by that, so let's see what they mean by that. Obedience to the Great Commission is not, uh, you know, the, the special calling of a sacred few. It's really the responsibility of every follower of Jesus Christ to ask the question about how he or she can be involved in God's mission around the world, um, how they can leverage what God has given them globally. The 
beauty is when we in the church and just the average members of the church realize this is not this is not a mission just for others. This is for all of us. And when we're all engaged in this, then we can we can finish this task. When I look around here, I see that every person here is a creation of God. And that when Christ went to the cross, he went to the cross with these people too. One of the things that is making me very excited about this whole thing is actually being able to share with somebody who may not have heard just for the first time, just to reach one person. And as Christ said, as you've done it to the least of these, my brother, and you've done it as unto me. He was talking to us more than just the homeless and the orphaned here in our own country. He was talking to us about the, about the spiritual homeless around the world. God has commanded us to take the gospel um, everywhere, from, from our backyards all the way to the ends of the earth. And as Christians, we are commanded to do that. And there is a place for everyone in missions. From my perspective of, as, as your IMB missionary, I need your help. I've got colleagues all over the world who need your help. I'm willing to risk it all. Seeming that he gave it all. I will not hold back into a comfort zone from my comfort level. Shorten the hand of Christ, shorten the hand of God. When people are dying, going to hell, needing to know there's a way their life can be changed and changed radically, I will not do it. I just will not do it. Our churches are called to combine together, use our resources together, our energies together, our giftings together to be a part of the spread of the gospel among these people. Group. The gates of hell cannot stop the accomplishment of the Great Commission when our churches together get serious about that task. But the fact that Jesus died for my sins and rose again so that I could be with God and I can have a relationship with Him, you know, there's no sacrifice. There's really no sacrifice. It's a question. What are you willing to be? His hands, his feet, his arms, his heart, his voice, his eyes, his ears. I am Southern Baptist Missions, and you are too. And we can take the SBC out of it, I guess, and just say, I am God's mission to the world. All around us, people are living in darkness and within our our very own culture it becomes increasingly darkened more and more each day we drift further and further away if there's ever been a, a country that has had the privilege and the honor given to them by God of having his words so uh, available to be so free to enjoy and to to witness and to live out our faith unrestricted it would be us but we have taken it for granted for so long that I fear that we are on the cusp of losing much of that. Now in the midst of this post-Christian culture that we live in, there is a rising uh, cry to restrain the Christian voice. It would be sufficient if you keep it inside your buildings or inside your home or inside your head, but 
<coughs> Excuse me. Don't take it to the marketplace and don't take it to the schools and don't take it to the colleges or take it to the Capitol buildings. Just be content and keep it to yourself. That to this point has been the, the growing mantra that we have heard over the course of the last 15, 20, 25 years. But it'll never contain itself there. There will come a day, and I believe this with all that is in me, that the cry will not only be, keep it to yourself, but you can't even do that. To believe in your heart and keep it in your head and your heart will be insufficient, you must reject. Every culture that's gone down that road has come to that point. You must denounce your faith and claim allegiance to this or that party or this or that government or this or that entity. What will you do? What will you do if there's a stripping away of those rights and privileges and freedoms that we have so wonderfully enjoyed and ignored? You do. And I think that's a question that has to be asked. You see some of the pictures out there of where where these missionaries have gone and where these tours have taken them, and 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 you see people constrained and living in deep darkness, and saying, "I am a Muslim. I need to hear the voice of God. I am homeless. I need to see the hand of God." I've been in several places in this world that uh, experience a deep, deep darkness that the gospel needs to penetrate. But I see that same darkness. You're at home. Miss Debbie, I didn't ignore you. I know you're there. I just had to get my thought out of my head. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you that we can pray and pray for our missionaries and the missions that they are on. All over the world, Lord. We have missionaries in some 160-some countries, I believe, Lord. And some of them aren't there as missionaries. They're there as teachers or construction people or engineers. But they're there, Lord, bringing the gospel with them because they're not free to just openly proclaim the word in those countries. If they went as a missionary, they would not be allowed in. But because they have the expertise, they're doctors, nurses, engineers, other things, they are welcomed in. They live under those constraints, but still, Lord, they seek to find ways to be your hands and to be your feet and to be your eyes and your ears and your voice. And I just pray for them. I pray for them, Lord, for their protection and their safety. But Lord, more than protection and safety, I pray, Father, that you will use them greatly to tear down the darkness and bring light where they're at. Lord, we have our dear friend, Pastor Luciano, Grace Baptist, out here uh, this morning in their world tonight and ours. And Lord, we want to pray for them. Pray that you'll stretch your hand out and put it upon my brother. Anoint him, Lord, in every time that he stands and opens the word and says, Thus says the Lord, you'll anoint his voice and anoint his preaching and his teaching. And that, Father, your spirit will move out and touch lives and draw them into the kingdom of God. I pray for our friends in Honduras. And for the church that exists there, Lord, that you will give them voice and you'll, you'll show them how to go into the dark places where they are and draw people to the light of Christ. 
I pray for Pastor John in in Germany, Lord, that uh, uh, they live in a very uh, uh, pluralistic society just like we do. Father, as they begin this church and start this church, might you, Lord, move your spirit greatly upon them and, and draw those people to yourself and establish a church in that in that community, Father. I pray for Pastor Sadiq, Lord, and his team as they seek to witness and minister this week in the midst of this festival. Lord, again, I pray for their safety and their protection, but more than their protection, Lord, I pray that you give them fruit to their labors. And Father, we pray for Ryan and Cynthia and the families, they get ready to move from Milwaukee out to Scapoose, that, Father, you'll, you'll keep them safe and uh, guard them, get that move made, help, help Cynthia, Lord. I know that, uh, you know, with her condition, that, Father, it's difficult for her to make, you know, these, these great moves, but, but, Father, you take care of that. Thank you that, that uh, Donna is home, and I pray you strengthen her day by day, and those that are ministering to her and caring for her. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray for my brother. Lord, they moved him out of the hospital intensive care and he's in rehab. And, uh, and Father, I thank you that he's sounded stronger, though he has uh, uh, two or three different conditions that really are terminal conditions, Lord. So I have no idea how long you're going to leave my brother. I just pray you give me that one last opportunity to share the gospel with him. Maybe now, Lord, with with facing in those final days, that, Father, he'll be open. And I pray that you open his heart and his mind to, to, to understand and receive and understand, Lord, that the time grows short. And Father, he, he make the decision, affirm the decision. God, I love you. And I thank you, Lord. Keep Tanya and, and Kirk safe on their, their their trip. God, I thank you they could get away. They could have this time together. Lord, it's been a long time in the making and the coming. So we thank you for that. And Sean and Michaela, as they move to, to uh, Fort Riley in Kentucky, those two babies, Lord, keep them all safe. I'm going to miss them, Lord. But uh, it's it, it, we stay connected. But uh, well, it's just different. So God, we just put all these things in your hands and trust you with them. And pray, Lord, that in the Word tonight, as we get into it, you'll just open our heart and our minds. That Lord, we'll drink in your Word, and it'll be nourishment to our hungry souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's see. Rick and Lena have come on. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Rick, get up, get to feeling better, and, and, and stop this foolishness, okay? We love you, brother. We want you on your feet, and we want you healthy, all right? So let's step back uh, to the first covenant that God made with man, the one that he made with Adam, and the one that Adam couldn't keep. You know, it always amazes me that there was there was only one thing that God asked Adam to do, and he couldn't even do that. You know, we think, oh, we got this plethora of laws. We got to jump through all of these hoops. He only had one hoop to jump through. Don't eat from that particular tree. Now, I know that every one of us could have stayed away from that. We could have said, oh, well, if that's all I've got to do, okay, I'll just build a fence around that tree and I'll stay away from that tree. Right. Remember the promise behind the covenant? That if Adam would refrain from eating from the tree of, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, he would eternally have access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden? And he would walk personally with God. Now, understand uh, that 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 I, I think it was Jesus, you know, that would come down and you know, kind of manifest himself, and they'd take a stroll. And I don't know how long that went on, but would you ever want to give that up? 
Yeah, I, I don't think I would. It, 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 I, how often? I don't know. And how long were they in the garden? We don't know. None of us do. Scripture doesn't say. But we know that it came to an abrupt end. So that's the uh, the Edenic hope, is it not? Eternal life. Life in the presence of God and in unbroken fellowship. Isn't that the Edenic hope? Now while our Edenic hope is not yet consummated, it will be in the future. And Christ has already begun making all things new, has he not? In him, the last Adam, you and I are new creations and then old new creation order is begun. And Second Corinthians uh, 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things, all new things have come. He's made us new. Kindness. Unique. Made after his own image. In a, in a unique way, his spirit coming in and making us new and alive. And though we have fellowship with him now, oh, just think what it's going to be like when we're in his presence. In his presence. Now, his presence is within us. I think you know what I'm talking about. When we see him holy high and lifted up, see him on his his throne, walk with him in the streets, hear him speak, hear his voice. More with the promises that God made to Jeremiah, well they find their fulfillment in the new covenant as well. You know, every promise that God made to Jeremiah and Jeremiah gives to us, we find its fulfillment in the new covenant. Let's just take a look at some of that. We read these when we were back there uh, uh, several weeks ago, and we'll get back to these scriptures in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah the northern and southern kingdom all brought together again. Not like the covenant which I made with their father in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they will be my people and they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying know the Lord for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more now hasn't this all been fulfilled for us? And in us? Isn't that what Paul's alluding to in Romans chapter 6 and verses 17 and 18 when he says, But thanks be to God uh, that though you were slaves of sin, that was your old condition, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having, begun, having been freed from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Isn't that the promise? God is going to free us eternally from the very bondage and the tyranny of sin and walk in his righteousness. Isn't that great? First verse in the eighth chapter of Romans, Paul, you know, he, he affirms loudly and, and, and with a wonderful voice, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We gotta learn to shout that. We gotta learn that when when we're feeling beat down and condemned, we 
pick up a mirror and take a look at ourselves and say, no, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And make that positive affirmation. Luke makes the same illusion as he writes, you know, the words there in, in that the, Paul speaks in, in Acts 13, in, in verses 38 to 39, therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed ah there it is through the law of Moses what the law could not do in that it's weak because of our flesh God did did he not by sending the Messiah his son that there in the flesh he condemned sin that he might impart to us all the righteousness of God. We need no further sacrifice for sin. For the sacrifice of Christ's death was sufficient to cover every sin. And then we go back and we pick up the Abrahamic covenant, right? All the covenant promises are fulfilled. God promises Abraham land and offspring and universal blessing and, and they all find their fulfillment in Christ who is the singular offspring of Abraham and whose death brings about the blessing of righteousness for the Gentiles. Paul in writing to the churches on the peninsula of, uh, on the Galatian uh, peninsula as he's trying to encourage them from the Judaizers he says to them in, in chapter 3 verses 13 through 16 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us and for as it's written cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Well, I'm glad of that. I got good friends that are Jewish, but I was born a Gentile. Aren't you glad? In order that Christ might, uh, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might uh, come to us, that uh, the, the blessing, the, the promises, remember? come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. All those belonging to Christ are now counted as offspring of Abraham and thus we are rightful heirs of the inheritance promised to Abraham and his offspring. Now I'm not I'm not talking about a revised kind of theology that says that uh, Israel uh, is is done pork bucket with a fork because God, you know, God hasn't got no use for them anymore. They rejected Jesus, so God's rejected them, and the church is the new Israel. No, some of these promises are to Israel in particular, not to a spiritual Israel, but to Israel in particular. I was looking at some footage that was uh, out there today of, of one of the hostages that was released by Hamas and what, what she went through. And uh, then some footage taken off of uh, some, some Hamas that have been captured and you know, some of the footage of the massacre itself was horrific. As I'm watching that, I'm thinking, one day, one day, God will drop this umbrella of protection over his people. And deal with the enemies of Israel. You know, when we were looking at that little study, uh, I don't know whether where I've got it up here. I 
I've got several. I've pulled in so many things that uh, you never, there we go. This was written back in the, uh, uh, Mark T Twain wrote it, so that might tell you how far back you know, it goes. And let me read it to you. It has to do with the Jewish people. It's his take on, on the Jewish people, if you will. And I think it's really interesting at this point because it all goes along with the promise uh, that God had made to Abraham. It says, if the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of a star uh, of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jews ought hardly be heard of, but he is heard of and has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world list uh, of, of great names in literature and science and art and music and finance and medicine and uh, obtruse learning are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in the world in all age and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose and filled the planet with sounds and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Romans followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone, and other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out. They sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energy, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Well, nowhere do I find that Mark Twain was a believer. But I would tell you the secret is that God sustains them because God is faithful constantly and always to his word. Galatians 3. Verses 25 through 29 says, But now that faith has come, we no longer, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. For all of you were who were baptized into Christ have been clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. The wild, graft, the wild, wild branch grafted in to the cultivated tree. That's what we are. And because of that, we are recipients of the blessings of the promises of Abraham. Well, as much as I thought I was going to get through tonight, I didn't. That might surprise everybody that's out there. But surprise! When we come back next week, we'll look at the Sinai promises and how the new covenant fulfills them. Father, I want to thank you so very, very much you love us supremely and beyond measure and we thank you for that now fill us Lord with peace <laughs> Lord, 
let the joy of the Lord just kind of bubble up in us tonight. God, how gracious and good you are to us. And I thank you. Now take us this evening, Lord, and let your word penetrate deep within our hearts fill our minds so that tomorrow when we go out and we meet somebody we can share some of these truths with them and be your voice your hands and your feet to you be glory and to you be all praise in Jesus name Amen God bless you all we love you and you have a great day uh, well, have a good evening and a good sleep and a good day tomorrow. And Pastor Luciano, you have a blessed, blessed day since your day is just starting. May God bless. I will see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And I'll see you on Sunday live and in person. Pray for me too because I want to go down in the next couple of weeks and see Tony. So uh, uh, you know, I'm going to make preparation for that. But uh, God bless you all. Good night.